adjunct professor in the business school at Unitech. The last time I introduced him to an audience, I paid tribute to the sense of erotic longing at the heart of all his best work. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but you actually have to be there. <laughs> um, uh, that, that was the uh, notorious Saturday night debate at uh, food camp, um, which goes all sorts of ways. But anyway, please do welcome the ship's wireless operator, Rod Oram. We live and die by the signals we send and receive. Now, this is a story I'll start with about two men who walk into a mongrel mob bar. This one is Michael Laws. <laughs> Lip curling, finger wagging. Things turn very nasty very quickly. He gets carried out horizontally by the mongrel mob in a box. <laughs> This is Richie McCaw. He walks into a mongrel mob bar, high-fiving and smiling broadly. They love him to bits. They hoist him on their shoulders, and he leaves triumphantly from the bar. Um, I raised the question about the signals we send and receive, because um, our overseas creditors are sending us some very important messages. And the question is, are we listening? And are we uh, sending the right signals back? Because if we aren't, we will die economically. But if we send the right signals, we will thrive. These are amazing times in the world, full of change, full of promise. Um, and if we send and receive the right signals, we'll be fine. But if we don't, we will die. Newfoundland is the nearest landfall to where um, the Titanic met its watery grave. And spring is a wonderful time of year. Uh, full of hope and danger. And after winter's long um, icy embrace, spring's thaw heralds new bounties of fish and crops. Um, but fresh dangers lurk too. Carefree young fellows dare each other to race across the tickle, leaping from ice floe to ice floe, heedless of the warnings from wise old men on either side. Um, or they fail to return from a fishing trip and the search party finds only an empty boat warming in the sun, but lifeless. The Titanic could receive plenty of warnings of the dangers ahead. The Marconi wireless telegraphic equipment it had on board was one of the most powerful sets in the world. Um, but during the late afternoon and early evening of the night that the ship and 1,514 people met their demise, the equipment was shut down to cool off, so it didn't get some of the messages. It overheated because of a flood of messages from the first-class passengers. They were sending really important things like, Wish you were here! The voyage of a lifetime! It's a marvellous party! Buy consolidated pistolium at a dollar! No more! <laughs> My darling, you wouldn't believe who's on board. The food, the decor. Sell consolidated pistolium at 50 cents. <laughs> You'll never guess who bought with it that merry widow Twanky, her first class cabin. I'm getting pissed on consolidated oleum. <laughs> These messages cost an arm and a leg. The price of the first ten words of a te Morse code tapped out telegraphic message was 12 shillings and sixpence. 150 New Zealand dollars in today's terms, adjusted for inflation. $15 a word, although each subsequent word was a bargain at $9. And I'm let, maybe those messages cost the lives of 1,514 people. We live and die by the messages we send and receive. After the Titanic hit the iceberg, Captain Smith delayed for 45 minutes before instructing Jack Sparks, Phillips, all wireless operators were called Sparks because that's how the Morse signal was generated. Uh, the senior of the two Marconi employees manning the wireless gear to send a distress call. He earned four pounds a voyage, 
the equivalent of 64 words of Morse code. He had celebrated his 25th birthday the day before. Before the night was out, he had died in Lightfoot. So much for intergenerational equity. The Marconi station at Cape Race, Newfoundland, picked up the first message but it, from the Titanic, but it was garbled. The intent unclear, the location lost in a cackle of static. The confusion was compounded by a technology fight between Marconi and Telefunken, slugging it out with this new technology. I'm assuming Telefunken was an upstart funded by Herr Dr. Kim Morse Code. <laughs> Marconi's emergency call was CQD, stop transmitting, pay attention, disaster. Telefunken's was SOS, not save our souls but simply chosen with Teutonic efficiency as being the shortest and clearest signal. Three dots, three dashes, three dots. The Titanic sank two hours after it sent its first distress call. The Carpathia, the first ship to reach the survivors, picking up some 700 of them, arrived less than two hours after the ship sunk. But if Captain Smith hadn't delayed for 45 minutes <coughs> sending that first distress call, far fewer people would have died. We know all about three of our great icebergs, which my crewmates have already told you about. So this is the fourth, and it's a whale of a problem. <laughs> what messages is this iceberg um, sending and receiving to us? After all, we live and die by these messages. So let me describe this um, whale of an iceberg a bit to you. Um, it floats in the vast ocean of debt. Um, and this is the waterline here, uh, whipped up by uh, intense uh, global financial mayhem and treacherous, made treacherous by tides of surging global change. This is, this is uh, the depth of this ocean. And this goes down 20, 40, 80 knots fathoms. But this is a, a debt chart. So this is net international liabilities as a percentage of GDP. How much we owe the world netted out against how much the, old, oh, the world owes us. And let me tell you, we owe the world a lot. So um, right down at the bottom here uh, of this chart is Davy Jones's locker, that wonderful euphemism um, for debt at sea. Now down there in this ocean of debt in Davy Jones's locker is Greece. Ireland and Portugal, around about 90% of GDP, net international liabilities. Well, let me chart um, our progress through this. Um, if you go back to 1973, that was the last time that we had a current account of a balance of payment surplus in New Zealand, um, in 1973. We had lots of deficits before. And then those pile up. So by the time we get to about 2011, our net international liabilities um, are about 75% um, uh, of GDP. They get better during the recession and because of the vast inflow of reinsurance money to rebuild Christchurch. Uh, but Treasury forecasts that by 2016, our net international liabilities will be round about 80% of GB GDP. We'll be knocking on the door of Davy Jones's locker. We live and die by the economic signals we send to the world and receive. So what is this Davy Jones chart telling us about how we're earning our keep in the world? Well, we run very slender trade surfaces and struggle to grow exports. We run massive deficits on our financial flows, importing capital and exporting interest, capital gains and dividends. And we fund this deficit by borrowing more and selling off our assets overseas which only increases our iceberg of net international liabilities. So let's start with the trade component of that. Like Newfoundlanders, we exploit our natural resources. Like them, we stand on the dock cheering ourselves on. But it's a meager living, made worse um, because we misread the markets, the signals our markets are sending us. So we get terribly excited that there are hundreds of millions of new middle-class Indians and Chinese and we think, oh, if only we sell them a few more lamb chops and a few tins of infant formula and a couple of bottles of wine and get some of them down here for a camper van holiday and a bit of bungee jumping. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how rich we will be. 
Our government is the greatest cheerleader of this, and it has set a goal of trebling our food and beverage exports by 2025 to $58 billion to help us lift exports from 30% to 40% of GDP to help us catch up with Australia. But, for example, take our largest exporter, the dairy industry. It concedes privately, they've never said this publicly, that at the very best, they could only double the value of their exports by 2025, and then only by milking about 75% more cows than they have now. Even the simple maths doesn't work out, and it rather begs the question of where we would put the next three million cows. <laughs> Newfoundlanders, with the help of foreign fishers, wiped out the great cod fishery of the Grand Banks near where the Titanic sank. We too will crash our ecosystem, as Rick pointed out, that very natural capital on which we depend for our lives and livelihood. On the financial flows that lay down more ice on our iceberg in the ocean of debt, I will speak only this afternoon of foreign direct investment, uh, the money others invest in us. Foreign direct investment is a wonderful thing when it helps you do what you can't do on your own. Taiwan and Singapore and Ireland were all brilliant examples of small countries that attracted foreign direct investment to allow them to build companies and industries that they couldn't do on their own, to build their economic heft, expand their exports and, and their wealth. And of course, China is just an even bigger example of that. So a very big tip to foreign direct investment that helps us build our enterprises and our industries, helps us earn a bigger living out in the world economy and start to melt that iceberg of debt. But there's only one problem, was that's when the foreign direct investment we get goes into the domestic economy. And that's where most of it goes. Over the last decade, 55% that's come in has come only to buy domestic companies to compete in the domestic economy. Most of that investment for Australia. About 40% um, has come from, uh, come here to exploit low wages, um, and uh, about 3 or 4% has come um, to exploit um, our natural resources, and about 2% um, to um, ex uh, do something with our intellectual property. That's incredibly damaging um, foreign direct investment. Um, because it means that it uh, generates very little, if any, new activity for the New Zealand economy, but becomes a big negative because of the outflow um, of profits and dividends. That bad form of direct investment is about the bleakest thing I can think of. Um, if we go on like that, it saps our lifeblood. It leaves us huddling on the tip of an iceberg of the, um, on the ocean of debt. We have a way to stop it, though. The Overseas Investment Act has criteria by which foreign direct investment is approved. These include the likes of whether uh, new technology will come to New Zealand or jobs be created uh, here or help us create markets overseas. But take, for example, Shanghai Punchin's purchase of the Crayfer Farms. The Overseas Investment Office concluded it would only create two new jobs in New Zealand, which were two blokes in a shed teaching people how to milk cows. Funny, I thought we knew how to do that. Um, it would introduce no new technology. In fact, they confessed in their application they didn't know how to dairy farm. Um, and the market skills it has in China, this I find completely fascinating. The OIO stated, New Zealand dairy industry um, already possesses, yet, um, the government um, approved this. And economically, it is a disaster because Panshin overbid by about 30% for that, those farms, thus distorting the market for farms and helping push them beyond the economic reach of New Zealanders. It will in due course have its milk processed here, but that gives only the local processor a small bit of money as a fee for doing that. <coughs> It will then export the product for the lowest price it can because it will ship it straight to its own supermarkets in China. And there at the cash registers, it will get its final reward. But so little of that um, economic activity will stick to the ribs of the New Zealand economy. Um, we will sell them um, some farm supplies and a bit of labor, but that's about the end of it. 
we should know better. Here in New Zealand, more than 100 years ago, the Vestley family, to name one, there were others, were doing exactly the same thing with their sheep farms and processing here and their chains of butcher shops in the UK. We were screwed then, we are being screwed now. Eventually, only a few of us will be left stranded on our iceberg in the ocean of debt. Mourning the departed. But how might it be different? And how will we chart a new course away from this particular iceberg and the others uh, to a warm, more bountiful sea? Well, by the light of the full moon, the survivors and stragglers must make it back to firm ground. We must listen to the dreams of young men and women, and we must see the visions of old men and women. And here's one as an old man, rather than an old woman, um, about wonderful foreign direct investment for China. Imagine Christchurch, quite close to the Cashel Street Mall, perhaps just behind Valentine's and the pop-up stores. A fabulous new building goes up there, an architectural gem. On the slowly, gently undulating roof uh, is wonderful grass, possibly even genetically modified, but we can debate that later, <laughs> where there are cows grazing. Underneath the cows, so to speak, um, are scientists who are working out how to turn that extraordinary um, um, uh, feedstock, that essence of life of that cow's milk, into something spectacularly valuable, like lactopharmaceuticals or bioactives. Other people are doing it. Nestle announced an incremental investment last year of 500 million US dollars to do exactly that. By the way, we hardly do anything here, in fact, in New Zealand. And down towards the ground floor, um, we've got um, people who are in um, pharmaceutical drugs trials for those lactopharmaceuticals. And so it's Lincoln University on the roof with the cows, and you can take an elevator up to watch the cows being milked if you want to. Um, in the middle are scientists, Chinese and New Zealanders, and on the ground floor is the medical school in Christchurch conducting those um, 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 pharmaceutical, those drug tests, um, with not just New Zealand but Chinese scientists too. <laughs> 